change begins within you because when you begin to change yourself and you begin to find the love within, that inevitably affects everyone around you. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. Today, we have a very empowering episode for you guys about shadow work, healing, alchemizing your pain into power, and returning to love. Our guest today is Ellie Lee. Ellie Lee is an on-camera personality on E, MTV, VH1, iHeartRadio, actress, and mystical life coach at Masters of Self University. Her spiritual awakening three years ago changed the course of her life, and now her purpose is to help humanity come back to love and oneness. Before we begin, I want to let you know that our new 2023 Artist of Life workbook is out. It's our top-selling guided journal to help you create your most intentional and successful year. You can check it out at shop.lavendaret.com. All right, on to the interview. Hello, Ellie. Welcome to the podcast. How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm so excited to be here and to be talking with you. I've seen a lot of your YouTube videos in the past. It was, it's interesting. Oh. I used to see a lot of, um, when I used to watch YouTube a lot during my spiritual awakening, um, I watched a lot of your videos. So it's really cool to be here with you. <gasps> oh, I didn't know that. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, okay. So first let's start out with like, why don't you tell us your story and what led to your spiritual awakening? Yeah, for sure. So um, I am just a little Korean girl from from New Jersey, born and raised. And uh, since I was little, I've always wanted to be in the entertainment industry, always. Uh, So when I was little, I was like, oh, I'm going to be an actress. And I think uh, when you grow up watching pop culture and entertainment, you don't see a lot of Asians. And so in my mind, I was like, oh, people that look like me don't do this. So I really buried that dream really deep down under. And then because I loved pop culture and entertainment, I was a kid of the late 80s into the 90s. So I watched a lot of MTV and I used to watch this show called Total Request Live, which was this live. Yeah, TRL. TRL, yes. (laughs) Um, I used to watch TRL so much. Like I used to be the girl that would like call in and vote for NC sync and like Britney Spears and all that stuff. And so that's when I started to realize like, oh, if I can't be an actress, then this is what I want to do. I want to be an on-camera personality and I want to be near all of these like pop culture celebrities and I want to understand them and just be in this world. And so since I was a teenager, all I've ever wanted to do was be an on-camera host. And so I used to watch like MTV Korea and I used to be like, this is, this is exactly what I'm aiming for. And so that's where my mind was. So when I got into college, I just started auditioning. I started interning everywhere. And I booked my first on-camera gig uh, in college. And then when I got out of college, that was the main focus. And eventually I quit my nine to five job and I just started going for it. And I lived in New York City. I became a dog walker and (laughs) I was auditioning for everything and anything. And all these gigs started to come in and I started to book. And so since probably 2009, I've hosted for MTV Korea. I host a MTV Snapchat show right now called Bob Quiz. I was a pop culture correspondent for VH1, iHeartRadio. I did a show with Complex. So I've been around the block for a long time. And I was, I started acting in 2012 as well. And so I was really in this world of entertainment. And I really thought, you know, I grew up super Christian my whole life. My mother is a daughter of a pastor and like I was at church Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And so for me, I've been fed what God is to me my whole life. And that never actually allowed me to connect with God. And I went through a lot of like spiritual traumas in my life. And so when I was in my early twenties, I literally cut myself off from God and I was like, none of that is real. And so I, what's the, what's the thing that's actually tangible and real for me. And the whole world was showing me that the only thing that was really good in this life was fame, notoriety, clout, and money. And so I was like, that's the thing. I'm going to be hugely successful in this this whole field of entertainment, that's what I'm going to go for. And so that's where all my focus went. And I think over the years, I was really getting sick mentally. I mean, I was always a very depressed, anxious kid since I was little. I've suffered from depression and mental illness and all of these things. I've been to every psychiatrist and every therapist and everything like that. And nobody could ever tell me what was actually going on with me. And so since I was a kid, I've 
I've been dealing with this and then going into the world of entertainment when where nothing is really actually real, I got lost in the sauce. And um, I signed a, a contract for a new show that I was going to host for a big network and I moved to LA and that was in 2019. And when I got there, I really started spiraling because I was like, I'm here now. And if I don't make something out of myself, if I don't prove to everybody that I'm worth something, then I can't go back home a failure. I can't be a failure. And so what happened to me was I hit rock bottom. I had hit rock bottom a lot, but this was like a whole different kind of rock bottom. And I finally heard the calling from the universe of it's time to look for something else. It's time to go deeper within. And I had always been drawn to people of quote unquote, the spiritual worlds, but because of my conditioning and programming from religion, I thought that spirituality, everything that was connected to that was like of the devil. Like literally I, when I would see people of the spiritual world, I'd be like, that's not real. You know, you don't love Jesus. You need to be saved. And it was all of this, this brainwashing that had happened to me. And so when I hit rock bottom, I, I got this like hit to like contact somebody in my life. And I contacted her and I was like, I don't know where to turn. I don't know where to go. I need help. And she was like, why don't you start shadow work? And why don't you join this program that I'm a, I'm a part of? And I was like, what shadow work? And as soon as I dipped my toe in, that was the beginning of my spiritual awakening. And I realized that the reason why I had such low self-worth, the reason why I was so depressed and anxious and all these things was because I had no love for myself. I had no idea who I was. I was in a very unhappy relationship where I was forcing um, uh, this this thing between my boyfriend at the time and I to keep going because I was so afraid to be alone. So it was this huge awakening to my codependency, my attachment, my low self-worth, my lack of love of self. And in 2019, the universe called, I finally picked up the phone and that was the beginning of my spiritual awakening. And the last three and a half years has been the most profound, the most brutal, the most insane ride of my life. And I have opened in ways that I never thought was possible. And since then, I've also, you know, kind of shifted in my, in, in really what I'm here to do and what my purpose is. And the deeper I go into myself, the more that's revealed to me. And the more I see how lost I was in the illusions of this world and what society expects of us and all these things. And my third eye is open and I never want it to close. And, uh, that is the kind of short uh, summary of my spiritual awakening. Now, a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. When life gets overwhelming, we can get stuck focusing on problems instead of solutions. Overthinking makes it nearly impossible to find peace of mind, which is why it's so important to seek help when we need it. I pay close attention to how I'm nurturing my mind with meditation, journaling, exercise, and BetterHelp online therapy. Speaking with a therapist on BetterHelp has helped me better understand myself and my mind. What I like about therapy is that it helps you tap into deeper emotions and fears that you may be unaware of. A therapist can also help you reframe your mindset, making it easier to accomplish goals no matter how big or small. BetterHelp is online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. When you want to be a better problem solver, therapy can get you there. Visit betterhelp.com slash TLL today and get 10% off your first month. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash TLL. Your story is amazing. I think there's so much to unpack there and I'm excited to get into it. I I love your story. First of all, as an Asian American growing up in the same era, basically, I relate to you, your story, like, cause I was into pop and entertainment culture. I loved MTV. I watched TRL. I wanted to be a TV host at one time, but I, I tried a little bit, but I didn't like fully get into it. It seems like, I think what's amazing about your story is you had a dream and you went for it and it, you actually achieved your dream on the outside. And then that was only the beginning Mm -hmm. of your spiritual awakening. So I think that part is letting people know that external success is not correlated to like spiritual success or, and and so that's one part that I do want to point out, but, but I don't want to brush over it. I think it's amazing what you did. (laughs) Um, And then the second part of realizing that fame and all of that was not real. Let's, let's talk about like, I, I'm curious how your mind has shifted. Like, who are you before and who are you now? What was your mindset like before and what is it now? 
You know, I always, and I'm sure you can relate to me on this. I always knew that I was different from other people. Like I, when I remember being a little kid and like looking around at people and like not understanding how they knew how to function in this world and in the society. And even in Hollywood, I was this very strange placement in a world where I knew that I was never going to fit in, but I was always trying to, like, if I'm a circle, I was trying to fit myself in a square Mm -hmm. and I was trying Mm -hmm. to do all of these things to fit in. So like the conversations I was having, the way that I was dressing, everything was me just trying to be like everybody else. But I knew that I could feel things so intensely. I knew that I was very keen into subtle energies. Like I could be in a group of people and see a slight shift in somebody's eyebrow and knew something just changed within them. And then not understanding why I saw that and nobody else saw that or how I could feel something in somebody that nobody else could feel. So I always knew that I was different, but because this world isn't fit for people like us, you think something's wrong with you. And so that's the story that I was telling myself a lot was, well, something's wrong with you. So fix yourself and also repress all of these emotions that you feel. I mean, I was, I've always been super sensitive and super emotional, but that was an acceptance. And I think, you know, as Asian kids being raised by immigrant parents, like for me, like in my culture, in Korean culture, like it's very taboo to be mentally ill, to have all these emotions, to have these sensitivities. And so since I was a kid, I've been conditioned to just hide it under the rug, be normal, be strong, because I knew that I had to survive this world. So everything that I actually was, was put in the back burner and then began the the birth of my survival self, which is everything that I'm not. And so my mindset before was just survive, just fit in, just be like him and her so that you can get to where you needed to get to. And so because I created this facade, I was wearing a million masks, like everywhere I was going. I, I didn't like, people would ask me about my opinion sometimes. And it was just like copycatting other people's opinions because what I actually felt I knew wasn't going to be accepted. And I knew that I was weird or like just not normal. And so the, was the birthing of just this version of me that wasn't me. And now it is the unraveling of my survival self to truly be my true essence, to be the divine being that I am. And when I step into my light, the more I step into my power, the more mass I take off. It is like this, the, the resonance that I feel, the true being that I am, the more I tap into her, the more that I heal, the more that I unblock, the more that I stop being in this world of fakeness, of unlovingness and all of these things is when I really start to really step into the beingness of who I am. And that journey alone is a whole mind F because I'm 35 years old, you know, which means that I've created a billion walls and a billion different versions of me for my, my awakening happening at 32. So for that's 32 years of being who I am not. That's why the last three and a half years have been so intense, but I would relive this journey over and over again if it meant that I was given the chance to come home to myself because coming home to myself is the single most biggest accomplishment it overrides everything I've ever done in my career. Because even in my career, all of those accomplishments were things that I could hold on to and be like, this is me. I am this and I am that. And when people would ask me about me, I'm like, oh, let me tell you all the things that I've done. When in reality, all of those things, none of those things matter. They're all illusions. They're all the things that the ego holds onto to be validated, to feel like I'm worthy. And now I'm like, who am I when I don't have any of that stuff? Who am I when all those things are taken away? And then I've come to the realization that I am the I am. I am nothing else. Everything else after the I am, this, I am, that, it's all things that your ego is holding onto. And the more I shatter those walls and the more I come home to me, whoo, it's, it's, I'm getting riled up right now because there is nothing like a soul coming home to the remembrance of who they are. Yeah. I love your passion when you speak on this. So I, I want to get into that self-worth story because a lot of people, myself included, are still still learning to accept themselves and love themselves as as they are. And what like what were the I guess most impactful parts of your journey that truly made you feel you were like truly worthy? I, I like 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 help us get into it. Like I see the transformation, but like, what did, what did that look like? What was it? 
Yeah. Well, first of all, I was in a relationship for four years where my boyfriend and I were, we were supremely unhappy, like supremely. Right. And even a year into the relationship, there was no more growth after that. But when I would bring this up to him, you know, because of where he was at and because of where I was at, I was really like gaslit to believe like this is the pinnacle of what a relationship is. Right. And so I was always wanting him to fill my cup. I was always wanting him to fix me, to love me because I need, I was missing something that I didn't know that had to come within me. And so the first thing that I did in my relationship with myself and my healing journey was I had to look at this codependent attachment that I had to this man. I had just moved to LA. I didn't know anybody. We just signed a 12 month lease to this new apartment and I had to make a choice because I knew that the the universe was shaking me. And the first thing that was brought up was, are you going to leave this relationship to begin a journey of self-discovery? Or will you stay in this relationship, attach and just be the smallest version that you have already been for the last four years? And I knew that this choice alone was going to rattle everything. And I chose to leave. And which meant that I had to go discover myself in a new city in a, in just a whole different place without my security blanket, which was him. And so that leaving that relationship provided me all of this space to really discover who I am when I'm not clinging on to somebody else. And that's when uh, the veil lifted and I realized I have no idea who I am. I don't like myself at all. I have no value. I have no worth. And I don't even know what it's what it means to love myself. And I think when I when I first heard the concept of self-love, I was like, okay, cool. So you like look in the mirror, you take a bath and like you get your nails done. You say, I love you, right? And that is not what self-love is. Self-love is the willingness to go into the depths of why you show up so insecure, why you show up so, why you show up always bringing yourself down, but uplifting others. Like one of my biggest programs that I used to run was powerlessness, which is literally, let me give my power to everybody else so that they can fuel me in some way. So that for that moment, this void that I feel within me is fulfilled. And when I began my self-love healing journey, I realized all of those things are momentary because those things will fade and then you're still left with yourself. And so that big breakup was the beginning of my self-love journey. And when I started to really fuel myself, when I started to look at like the way that I was parented, my inner child wounds, like why, why did I show up in certain ways? Why was I so weak in so many areas? Why did I do all of these things to appease other people? I realized like, well, girl, we got to start at level one. We got to start at ground zero. And I started literally from my childhood. And I started to see all of the things that happened to me, right? I used to think that I used to think that things happened to you. And now I realize, no, things happen for you. There is no, no such thing as coincidence. There's no such thing as, oh, that's a bad card that was dealt to you. No, I am truly in, in, in the belief that our soul chose everything that we experienced, the way that we were raised, our parents, everything for a very specific reason. So if my soul chose to have this child, to have these experiences, then actually what am I here to learn? And the realization of that just opened me because then I started stop being, I was, I was in such victim consciousness all the time. It was always like, feel bad for me. Woe is me. Do you know what I'm like? Do you know that I have mental illness? It was like all of these things that I would like stand behind and be like, this is why I'm weak. This is why I'm like this. And it's like, no, baby, those are just here for you to overcome so that you can shine in the light that you are. And that's when I really started opening and like I started reading books, I started meditating and all these things. And I was like, holy crap, there is so much to unravel and undo here. But that breakup was like the catalyst for everything. Yeah. Wow. No, I love so much of what you said. I also believe everything happens for you. You, I believe your soul chooses your parents. It chooses to go through whatever like difficulties and challenges that you have to go through. Um, and I, I think even that small shift in mindset, like it, like looking back, things will make a little bit more sense. I mean, what is your advice that you can give our listeners on how to cultivate more self-love now? Like, were there any, like, what was your main like when, when you're talking about working with yourself, was that like a lot of journaling? Like, I don't know what, any actionables you can share? 
I'm in a, a very different place now in my journey because I went through this really intensive alchemy program of really learning what it means to alchemize energy, right? And so, but in the beginning of my journey, it was like, let's start from ground zero and let's really look into how I was raised and how I, that affected me as an adult. And, you know, I, I'm going to say this, and I always say this, I love my parents. Every parent did the best that they could with everything they were given, right? And for me to sit here for a long time, I blamed my mother. I'd be like, she's the reason I'm like this and she's the reason like that and he's the reason. And it was just blame, 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 blame. But blaming others doesn't get you anywhere. And so I shifted my mindset is, okay, why was I raised with a mother like this? And why did I go through all of these experiences, right? And so my self-love journey really began with straight up journaling. I had never journaled before and not journaling like, dear diary, today I went to the grocery store and like, no, it was dear diary or dear journal. Today I experienced this and this is what it made me feel like. And the deeper I started going into why do I feel like this and what is causing me to feel like this, that's when I started really discovering these little pieces and bits and parts of me that I never knew, right? So for example, I was, I always ran a program of like defensiveness. Like if you came, first of all, I'm a double Aries. So, and I have a lot of fire in my birth chart yeah. and I'm a New Yorker. Okay. And my mother, <laughs> like Korean, Korean women were spicy too. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm a fighter. I'm a warrior. So like for me, it was like, if somebody came into my face, it was, it was never a place of like, of like, okay, what's going on here? Let me like analyze this. It was like, oh, you want to go? You, so <laughs> I, it was always like me defending yeah. myself. And that, mm. that part of me came out and it was really ugly. And I didn't, mm. and every time a situation where I was defending myself came out, I would walk away and I'd be like, why do I feel awful? And why did not that interaction not make me feel good? So then my job is to go, where does this defensiveness come from? Why do you, Ellie, when someone comes at you, you go from zero to a hundred. And before I was always like, I'm an angry person. And I'm strong. That wasn't strength. That's me being in my weakness. That's a wounded little child that shows up because she had to protect herself. So then I had to go into when was the first time that I had to, that I felt defensive? When was this energy birthed within me? And that's, that's how you really begin to understand yourself. The first step of healing is self-awareness. If you're not aware of yourself, if you're not aware of the way that you act, the way that you behave, you're never going to get anywhere because all you're going to do is not only project your shit on others, but you're going to constantly blame, blame, blame and say, they're, they're the reason it's their fault. No, baby. It's all about you. These people show up to reflect back to you something that is in your shadow aspect that needs your attention and love. And that was like the first step into my healing of like, why am I the way that I am? Yeah, I love that. That's so useful because it's a lot of people, they they just take their personality as, as like, oh, that's just the way I am. I, I'm just born this way. I'm just angry or I'm just like this. And so there's a reason, there's an emotional or energetic reason why you your body naturally goes to that like, you know, defense mechanism or whatever it is. And I love having you on the podcast because I think we're we're different because you your natural inclination is to like fight and to like protect yourself. And then mine, because I'm a sensitive, softer kind of person. So mine was to be like cry and don't tell anybody about my sadness. Like like you know, people deal with things in different ways, but I I think there's so many people that are like you that naturally they think they're strong, but it's the strength, the strength is masking something something else. And like everybody needs healing, right? Everybody like has suppressed their emotions at some point, but it's, I think people, yeah, yeah just recognizing that people are different and, and that it looks different for everyone. Yeah. And I love what you said about, I love what you said about people are like, well, I'm just angry. This is just my personality. And like, that's exactly how we bypass all of our pain, right? We just go, this is how I'm built. No, it's not. You think, you think you, your soul came into this, like an angry, you know, you're a divine being Div divinity isn't angry, right? So instead of bypassing the anger, go into why you're angry, go into where this energy was created and lives within your energetic field, because it'll be there until you decide to go into the darkness. And that's what we're all afraid of, right? Fear blocks us from going to the dark. It's too painful. It's too much. 
And so we stay repeating cycles and patterns over and over and over again until you stand up and go, actually, this energy, I want to take this and transmute it because it doesn't serve me for my highest good. We don't understand, like, we're literally in a maze just looping. And, and in reality, this maze has a billion exits that get you to the next level, to get you to the next level. But we go, no, it's too painful. That's why the healing journey is warrior's work. Because most people don't want to get their sword and go into battle. They'd rather be in the cave where it's safe, right? And so the people that take that next step, that's why this is the warrior's journey because that next step is so... F- but this is what I always say to people. Fear, think about the energy of fear. It's so low, and yet it's the reason why we can evolve as a humanity because we're controlled by fear. There is fear is fed to us at every table, at every angle, right? So then we stay in this very low frequency of fear. But every time somebody conquers a fear and you look back, you go, oh, that wasn't anything. Yeah, because you're so much more powerful than that fear. And your job is to go, I'm ready to walk into the fire. But most people can't walk into the fire because it's too scary. But I say to you, if you really knew and remembered who you were, which is just unconditional love, if we truly believe that all we are is consciousness, is source, experience itself as all of these different beings, it's experiencing itself as you, as me, as my dog, as the plant outside. If we truly understood that all we are is unconditional love, That means that we can overcome anything and everything this life throws at us because all we are at the core of it is love. And love is the only and greatest frequency that exists. Yeah. So beautiful. Love it. Um, Okay. I I think this leads us into talking about like alchemizing our pain. (laughs) So what do you mean by alchemy and how do we alchemize our pain? Does that just mean like turning our pain into something into, into growth and evolution. Yeah. So, you know, Mm -hmm. I was two years into my, my healing journey. Right. And I was doing everything. Like I was taking cold showers. I mean, I like, when I get into something, I'm all, you tried everything. I tried everything. Girl, 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 I was reading everything. I was listening to all these podcasts. I was meditating twice a day. I was, you know, doing breath work. I was doing all of these things. Right. And I was thinking like, Oh my God, like, look at me, I'm healing everybody. Right. And then I would get triggered and then I would spiral into all of these like really unhealthy habits. I was just, I was just cycling basically. Right. And so I knew that I, I knew that there was something greater to understand healing. Like what is, what does it really mean to heal? Right. And so what I started to do was I was talking to the universe and I was like, listen, I am asking to bring a mentor, a teaching, a teacher, anything that can help me get to the next level of my healing journey, because I feel like I've been doing a lot of things, but I'm not really evolving. Right. And so I kept putting this intention out. And I, the, and when I would be, when I would say this intention, it was this really, this really core, genuine, authentic place of, I want to be better for myself so that I can do more for the collective so that I can do more for the world. You know, because people like you and I, we have platforms. There's a reason why we have platforms. There's a reason why when people listen to us, we resonate with them, right? Which means like our soul chose to have that characteristic for a reason, right? And that's a part of our journey for a reason. And so- I knew that people were resonating with me, but I wasn't growing even in my content because even in my content, it's just the journey of my, I'm very raw in in the way that I share on TikTok and Instagram, right? And so I started calling in teacher. And then one day I was just driving aimlessly in nature with my dog. And I put on this random podcast. All I put on was like, because I knew my mind was overtaking me. And I just put in like mind programming. And I stumbled upon this podcast and it was with this woman named Rachel Fiore. And as soon as I put it on my soul, I could hear like my soul shaking and my soul was like, this is the next step. And so Mm. I just was like, who is this woman I need to understand? Because her wisdom was so grounded. It was everything that I was learning from everybody else, but it was rooted in, in a way that was so tangible and practical for me, which is everything all these things, this breath work, meditation, all these things, they're great. They're tools for us, plant medicine. They're all these tools that help us on our journey, right? But what happens when someone gets reliant on that? Then all of a sudden we give our power to these things, right? So we give our power to the the meditation teacher, to the plant medicine. And I started to realize what, what she was saying was everything is within. 
You are an alchemist. So then how do we take energy because all we are is energy because we live in this low density, this low dimension, everything is physicalized and most people can't understand energy because you can't touch it because it's not tangible, right? Because it can't be proven to you. But we all know that we can feel energy when we walk into a room. We know Mm -hmm. when energy shifts within somebody. We know when it shifts within us right? We know when something's activated. So it is, that's why faith is so crazy because it is the unseen. And so that's when I walked into this program and I was like, I'm, I want to be a coach for you. And so teach me how to do alchemy. And so basically for six months, the first three months were, was going through myself, was understanding how, how do I take my pain and transform it? And so what is energy? And everybody knows it's science, right? Energy can never die. It can only be transferred to something else, right? Just like when you put an ice cube into a boiling hot water, it's the ice cube doesn't disappear it turns into water, right? And so that's energy. It's always alchemized into something else. So then how can we not do that with all of our wounding? How can you, how can we transfer anger and unworthiness and alchemize it into love and power, right? And so I was like, okay, teach me, how do we do this, right? And when I entered this program, I was like, I'm gonna learn a few things. My life exploded in the most intense way because the universe was like, you ready now? You ready to remember how to do this? And I was like, I guess so. And so my life blew up. And so what I teach people now as a mystical life coach is, first of all, there's a trigger, right? So let's say, Aileen, you called, like, but you said something to me that triggered me. And everybody knows what a trigger is. If it's something takes you 100% out of peace, you're triggered, mm-hmm. okay? Yep. So then the trigger is there. Let's go deeper. What are, what's your, what's the mental programs that are playing? What's your mind saying about this trigger? So for example, I'll give you a great example. I was triggered recently because, uh, my boyfriend, uh, he's on, he's on the same level as me. Right. Uh, and, and we're both mystical life coaches together and he is accelerating at a really fast pace. Right. And I see now that his soul definitely came here to be enlightened. And recently my teacher, our mentor was really complimenting him a lot, right? And I was in the same room as him. And I started getting triggered by that, right? And so my job is to not to go, oh, F him. He thinks he's better than than me. My job is to go, ooh, what's this going on here? Like, why do I feel all of these like, quote unquote, negative emotions? And so when I started going into it, right, it was like, what's the trigger? The trigger is that my teacher is complimenting my boyfriend and I feel like he's better than me. So then what is my mind saying? I suck. I'm unworthy. See, Ellie, you're never good at anything. You can never accomplish anything. You're just always subpar, Ellie, right? And then the next thing is, what are the emotional programs that are triggered within me? Worry, anxiety, fear that I'm falling behind, unworthiness. I'm scared. I have literally anxiety rushing through me. And then it's, how am I behaving out of that? So what are the behavioral programs? Well, I shut down. I close up. I get really quiet, which is something my inner child did a lot. Every time I felt like I wasn't worth something or I wasn't seen or I wasn't heard, I would just close up and I get super quiet. And then the next question is, how old are you? How old do you feel? And then bam, I knew that the core wound for me was unworthiness. That's a core wound that's been with me my whole life of never feeling like I'm worth anything, right? So the trigger was that my boyfriend's getting complimented. It's never about the trigger. It's about all the energies underneath the trigger. And so I hit the core wound of unworthiness and I felt unworthy since I was like three since I can remember. And then when I tap into that, that's the energy that's being activated right now, right? So that energy is asking to be seen and to be loved. And so then the next question is, how do I love this energy so that I can transform it? So now that I've done all the journal work to get to the unworthiness, now it's about how do I open my heart and invite the darkness in? Because all I've ever done is when I feel unworthiness, I close and I repress and I suppress and I'll do anything else so that I don't feel this pain. When in reality, The way to alchemize is to feel the pain, is to feel everything that your little child felt when this energy was first birthed in you. So then I go in and I spend time with her and we go into that place of when did you still, when did you feel unworthy, Ellie? 
It was like, oh, I remember I was three years old and I remember I was in karate class and all the kids were like breaking like these karate boards and I was the only one that couldn't do it. And I was so embarrassed and I was so shamed. And then after that, that unworthiness just kept visiting me over and over again, whether it was through piano classes, whether it was through schooling, whether whatever it was, that energy just kept being activated over and over. But because we're not taught to learn how to love this energy, how to open our hearts, to invite this energy in, to spend time with our inner child to let them know, hey, that was just an experience. You are worthy, baby. It's got nothing to do with how many boards you can break, how good you are at school. But that's what the world tells us. That's that's That deems us worthy. And so our job, my job is to open my heart, invite the energy, love my inner child, let her know what it means to be worthy, remind her of the divine being that she is, remind her that all of these experiences are not here to bring her down. They were just here for her to experience this. And now that she's carried all of this, let me show you what it's like to be in your heart. Let me show you what it's like to love this. And the more that I feel the unworthiness, the more that I open my heart to it, that's how you begin to alchemize because it's the remembrance of who you truly are. And that's not going to happen overnight, especially (laughs) if it's a core survival wound. So every time you are triggered and this wound comes up, your job is to go into the pain. Your job is to love the pain. Your job is to get out of your mind and everything these programs that are running tells you to do. And instead drop into the beingness of who you are and then invite, go into the darkness. I literally, I envision myself walking into the darkest cave. And when I walk into this dark cave, all of these things are going to come at you. But how do I open my heart and be the divine being that I am outside of this physical body, outside of this physical existence? And then when the pain comes into the light, there's no chance because the light is love. And when you step into your, the darkness, that's power. That's, that's the willingness to go, I'm not afraid of this anymore. Actually, it excites me because it's the invitation to come home to myself even more. And the more I alchemize the unworthiness, the next time this trigger happens, it's not as painful as it is. As it is. Because yeah. I'm with my boyfriend right now and every time he evolves and now my teacher compliments him, All I feel is love for him and joy for him and happiness for him because what I'm accepting within myself is love and joy and happiness because I'm inviting the pain into my heart. Does that make sense? So that's permanent healing because everything is just energy. That's all it is. That's all it is. And we have the power to transmute anything into anything else. So why not open our hearts and transmute them with the love that we are? Yeah. No, I, I love that. I, I think I want to get into, cause I, I understand it and I've experienced this in my own life, but I think what people, our listeners might have difficulty with is like the first step is like when you f- get triggered, you feel the pain. I think the first step is like learning to like, just feel it and be aware of it. And then I think the part it, that people might have difficulty with is like, then like bringing the love in, like, you know, that, that part where it's like, you, like trusting that you are worthy because if you are someone who for your whole life believed that you were unworthy, yes, you'll feel triggered. Yes. You're going to feel the negative emotions. And then it, it's that next, like, how do you, how do you really trust and bring love? How do you really, you know, you can talk to your, your inner child. You can like, like what, what are the ways that you, you do that? Well, I think anything is a practice, right? So even connecting with your heart, you can say to someone connect with your heart, but somebody goes, I don't even understand what that means. Like, I don't know how to do that. Right. And that's why this is a practice that needs to happen every single day. So when I go into quote unquote meditation, this is not just me like going into like no zone place and just meditating. I don't meditate anymore. I literally close my eyes. I don't even use music or anything. And I let my mind do whatever it needs to do, right? Because as soon as you go in, when you close your eyes and you set the intention of dropping into your heart, your mind's going a million miles per hour, right? There's all of these things that it's saying, like, you can't do this. You can't do that. My job is let the, let the mind go, let the mind go. And just to connect to the middle of my chest, to really envision like this light that is my heart right? And to just focus in this place of being so connected to my light that my mind 
can't even compete anymore. And I do this every single day, dropping in, connecting, and feeling my heart expanding, feeling the light expand, expand, expand. Every time you take an inhale, let the light expand, expand, and then let the light just start emanating out of your chest. Let it go down your spine, up through your crown chakra, down into the floor, and just feel the light coming out of your body. And when you connect with your heart, you will know that you're connected with your heart, but it takes practice. It takes the willingness and devotion to do this every single day. And then like literally I'll be in conversation sometimes and I'll get triggered by somebody and I'll take a moment, even while I'm speaking to them of dropping into my heart and I can feel the light within me. And I can remind myself, baby, this trigger right now is just an experience for you. It's just an invitation. It's bringing up something, open your heart and love this. Even during this conversation, love this right now, love you. And the more you connect to that every single day, the easier it becomes to just connect with your heart so that every time you're triggered, it just goes connect to my heart. And then you connect you open, you expand, let it in. Remember the beingness of who you are, the divine light that you are. And that's when alchemy begins to happen. Ooh, yeah. I love that because it's like an anchor. It's like, I, I think that's actually really actionable. Like just to have like a practice that you can come back to. Cause when you do get triggered, your emotions are all over the place and then you kind of forget what to do. You're just feeling everything. Right. So, so yeah, just remembering to like drop back into your heart, connect with your body, connect with your, your soul. Yeah. I, I thank you for sharing that. Um, so I, I do want to ask you also about how to like your journey of like releasing all this programming and conditioning from society, how do you start to undo all the things that you were taught? I think it's firstly being acutely aware of your conditioning and programming because we are so conditioned and we are so programmed that we don't even know that we're programmed. Like literally, right? So like even the idea, and I'm sure we're going to get into this because a lot of my content too is about romantic love and conscious relationship and partnership, right? Right. I've been conditioned to believe, for example, that when my soulmate comes into my life, that's it. I'm saved. My life is going to be happy. This person is my other half. He's going to fulfill me. He's going to be everything that I need to ever feel love and happiness in this life. That's a program. That's conditioning. And then we get into a relationship and then we put all of those expectations on our relationship. And then why do we think it fails? Well, because you're running programs. Because you're, you're, you literally think this person needs to fulfill your needs. That's a program that we run, right? Even the program of the one. Since we were little kids, it's like Prince Charming, the one. All of these things are placed on us by society, right? Even the, even women, right? We're so programmed to believe. And all we know is, oh, we got to be subservient. We got to be in the kitchen. We got to be just be clean. We got to be, that's all conditioning and programming, right? And so many of us adhere to that because we think that's the way it should be, or that's the way we are. That's the way society tells us to be. And our job is to go, what is conditioning and what is programming? And how do we crumble all of that so that we can just be the powerful beings that we are? And so it literally is self-awareness. What is programming and what is conditioning? And how do we blindly, unconsciously reenact and live in that programming every single day? Right. And so even the idea of like, I need to have a nine to five job because it gives me health insurance and benefits, all that stuff. That's all. Everything is programming. It all is. And then the moment someone goes, actually, I'm going to go. F all of this and go for my dream. Like, look at you, right? When you started your YouTube channel and you grew this empire, you know, I'm sure a lot of people were looking at you and being like, what are you doing? What are you doing? But that was you breaking the mold. That was you going out of this programming of like, it has to be like this and it needs to be like this because that's the way society tells you to be and how to act. And it's like, no, you can do and be whatever you want to be. But your job is to be so powerful that you can break every single wall that we've built because they told us to build. So it, it really is the power of self-awareness. Yes. Once you start to become aware, you're aware of the, because I think I would also advise people to ask yourself, what are the things that you believe are true? Like the things that you just take, like this is, this is, this is the truth, but it's nothing really is absolute truth outside of love <laughs> and certain things, right? Like everything else is just an opinion or a suggestion or like all the rules that you, you just have in your mind. And yeah, self-awareness is like starting to recognize that and realizing I can change. 
I can decide not to believe this anymore. I want to give a, like a really simple example, right? So like a couple of months ago, I was at this store, right? And this girl walked in. And as soon as she walked in, I started judging like her outfit, right? And I started saying all these things to myself, like, it was so ugly. Like, why would she wear that? And then bam, I caught myself running the program of judgment. And I was like, you're judging her, Ellie. And why is this program running right now? And I literally had to quickly come into my heart and be like, Ellie, you judging her is just showing you an aspect of you that is very insecure, Mm -hmm. right? So this girl came in to be a teacher for me to show me that I'm running the program of judgment. So every single time that I'm doing something that doesn't come from love, I'm running a program. That's it. That's, that's what it is. As soon as those programs are running and you're not coming from love, you're away from your heart. That's it. You're detached. Your job is to go, what programs are running right now so that I can come back to love so that I can come back to my heart right now. Right. So like, and another thing was like, I, my, my boyfriend, I bumped into this woman, right. And she was like talking about how this one store that's this famous store in town won't let her like make an appointment because they have too many appointments to like come like see this product that they have that everybody wants. Right. And she was like, I've been here for 54 years and like they should let me have this appointment, blah, blah. And as soon as I was watching her, I was like, oh, she's running the program of entitlement. Right. So it's like the more you become aware of the programs that you run, it becomes easier to see in others the programs that they're running because you're so acutely aware. Anytime you're out of love, you're running programs. And then your Mm -hmm. job is to go, what programs are running right now? Yeah. I love that. Anytime you're out of love, it's a program. Be aware of it. (laughs) Because, Aileen, all we are is love. That's it. That's why they call this time the greatest time in human evolution. Why? Because so many of us souls came here to what they call the great awakening, which is awakening to the the beings that we really are. Who are we when we are not in this physical body, in this physical existence on earth, right? And so these souls that are waking up right now, we're waking up to all of the illusions of this world all the illusions. And that's why we are here to be the trailblazers, to be the pioneers, because the ones that are in it right now that are awakening, think about it. We are the minority, right? So everybody in my life, most people think I'm nuts, right? I've lost (laughs) a lot of friends because they think I'm crazy, right? Because they think like, what's wrong with you? Why aren't you doing everything that the world is telling you? Mm-hmm. Because I wasn't. Why aren't you the programmed person that you exactly, used to be? Clearly. Exactly. Right. So we are the trailblazers for a reason, right? Because humanity is, we're in the age of Aquarius, which means everything must crumble so we can rebuild again to come back to love. That's why even, I don't know if you know about 3D to 5D, right? We go from 3D, which is people, people are like, we're going to hell, like hell. No, we are in hell. Earth is hell. This is hell. Think about it. Rape, racism, violence, murder, war, poverty, like all of these things. This is hell, right? Because everyone in themselves is experiencing hell because there's so much self-hatred. So people go, how do we change the world? Protests and all of these things are great, but not if you're going into a protest hating other people. Not if you're going in coming from hate and anger. Change begins within you because when you begin to change yourself and you begin to find the love within, that inevitably affects everyone around you. That's why the healing journey is so lonely too because we're scattered all over the world. And the more light frequency that erupts within us, more light comes onto this earth. And that's how we shift humanity from the age of hate and war and unlovingness to love and unity and oneness, to understand and know that we are all one, but they keep us separated and divided because they don't want us to know who we really are. They don't want us to come together because once we're together, it's game over. That's it. There is no difference between you and I. You and I are love. We come from the same place, but we forget that because of conditioning and programming and brainwashing Mm -hmm. and trauma and unhealed stuff and wounding. Yeah. Yeah. So much, so much there. Um, I, I, yeah, I do want you to talk about 
a conscious relationship? Because I think that's a big part of what you share. So what is a conscious relationship? Tell us what you've learned in your conscious relationship. Oh my God. So, uh, you know, I've, I've always been a sucker for love. My, for people who know astrology, my Venus is in Pisces, which is like, literally for me, I'm like very dreamy, romantic, like, oh my God, I can't wait for him. Right. And so I've been manifesting like my partner for a long time. And, you know, I think in all of my past relationships, I look back on it now and it's all been attachment. It's all been codependency and it's all been needing somebody to fulfill what's missing within me. Right. And last time I checked, that wasn't, that's not love at all. Mm -hmm. And most relationships that exist right now are codependency. They won't admit it, but it is a lot of attachment. It's a lot of our, your in your wounded inner child and all of the energies that you run, all the programs that you run vibrate at a certain frequency. And that attracts another person that's also vibrating at that same frequency. Right. So when you look at a lot of, um, uh, relationships out there, like for example, I met, I spent time with this couple recently, right? His story was that he was raised with no mom or dad. So he's got uh, crazy abandonment uh, wounds, right? Which means his programs are abandonment, which means that he attaches. And then her mm -hmm. programs were that she was always the caregiver to all of her siblings. So she always yeah. played the role of mother. So she's so the then, mom, yeah. Exactly. So then his yeah. programs and her programs, because her programs are that I need to take care of somebody, right? That gives mm -hmm. me validation and fulfillment. His programs are, I need somebody to take care of me. So then that's the same frequency. So they vibrate and become a couple and they think that that's mm -hmm. love. And this is no judgment. This is just mm -hmm. what I'm witnessing. Yeah. And this is also how I've been my whole life because all I've searched for was somebody to literally hold me and love me because I didn't get that as a kid, right? And so when I started to see that, I started to realize none of that is love. We think that's love, that's not love. And so when my partner came into my life, like the first thing that I do when I get into any kind of relationship was... I go all in. Like, I'm like, I'm like, marry me, literally, li literally, right? And not understanding that that was woundedness. So my boyfriend was abandoned when he was, a, when he was a little child by his mother, right? And my whole thing is that I was raised with, in, a, with a very enmeshed mother, but my mother had a lot of wounding. And so I was kind of like, um, the whipping board for my mom. So I, it was always this relationship of like, all I wanted her was to love me. I just, all I've ever wanted was her love. Right. And hit him, his whole wounding was that he had a mom that loved and then left. Right. And so when we met, I was like, this guy is it. He's on the path. He's healing. Like I need to lock him in, lock him in. Because for me, that's how my inner child feels safe is that if I lock him in and he's here, then he won't go anywhere. And then I can have all the love that I want. Right. And so in the beginning of our relationship, I came in way too fast and I attached, like my claws were in and everywhere he was trying to run, I was chasing. And his whole thing is, I don't know what this is. You're too clingy right now because he was abandoned. So uh, my inner child's running after him and he's running away, right? And so after a month, he was like, I can't do this. I need to leave. And when the moment that he left me, everything came up to the surface, like crazy rejection, crazy abandonment for me. This whole thing of like, I thought you were going to love me. I thought you were going to be the one for me, but why? And all, I saw all of my shit. And so that was the moment for me. Oh, codependency and attachment and rejection. These wounds are coming up because it's time for me to heal this shit because I don't want to ever need anybody because the needing, that's a wound. Mm -hmm. Needing somebody, yeah. that's not yeah. love, yeah. right? Because we're conditioned to believe that two become one in a romantic partnership. That's wild because that means you need someone to fulfill the love within you. When in reality, two become three, you come in whole, she or he comes in whole, and then you create this beautiful love together that no yeah. matter if this person leaves or not, you're always going to be okay. Because when yes. the need is healed, then you show up in a whole different way because now it's, I don't need you. I choose you. I choose to love you every day. I don't need you to love me. I'm going to love me. I'm going to do me. I'm going to put me first. But having you here is an addition to my life. It's not you fulfilling. So when I when I when he and I got back together, I was 
I still had wounding for sure. I'm still working through a lot of it, right? Because he is my greatest mirror. That's another thing is people are like, where's my soulmate? Baby, when your soulmate comes, you better be ready because your soulmate (laughs) is going to be your greatest mirror in your life, which means it's going to reflect back to you every single blind spot that you are afraid to feel because in a romantic relationship, it is when you are the most vulnerable. It is when everything is on the line because friendships, it's like, you can, you know, friendships are like, oh, we're friends, but romantic relationships, whole different ball game. So in my relationship, it's not ever me being like, you make me feel like this and you did this to me. And how come you, it's not like that. It's, oh, you're triggering me right now, which means you're gifting me right now, which means you're presenting a present for me right now. So I'm yeah, going to go like, take thank some- you. Yes, exactly. It's literally, <laughs> yeah. thank you. Even though it's painful. Oh, wow. Like I didn't know I had that in me. Wow. Thank you. Yeah. Some, that still happens to me with my relationship as well. It's, it is such a great mirror, like, but, but to, it's the difference in mindset instead of like blaming the other person or even blaming yourself. It's like, Oh, I didn't know I still had that in me. Like, thank you for for bringing it out. Let me let me look at it. Let me work through that. Yes. And so, you know, a wound that I work through a lot with him is like I have this fear, right, that I'm working through of like he's going to leave me, right? And so every time like he says like my boyfriend is very much on the healing path and so we take divine responsibility over ourselves, right? So he and I we don't fight. I go, "Woof." You, you just, so for example, his whole thing is like, now that we're together physically, right? Cause we had a long distance relationship. He said to me, you know, uh, a couple of months ago, he was like, I need alone time. And as soon as he said that, all I could feel was such sadness and rejection. And the thing that I did was I close up and I'm, and I go, mm-hmm. okay, yeah, that's fine. And I'll walk away and I'll just be in this sadness. Right. And so him being a conscious partner to me, he'll go, Hey, your energy is just, just, just shifted. Why don't we talk about this? What's going on here? Right. And so then my job is to go, all right, here's what you triggered in me. So when he says the words, I need alone time, my inner child goes, oh, he doesn't want me. He doesn't love me. He doesn't want you anywhere near him. So you better pack your bags, girl, and you better be ready to go because he doesn't want to be with you. Right. And that's how, that's what, that's what happens. And I realized through that time, oh, my heart is closed. Like I can't open my heart because if I open my heart, it's too dangerous. So instead of coming from a place of understanding why he, his, him saying I need alone time is, is not him saying, I want to be alone. I don't want you to be with me, but that's how my inner child and my wounding interprets it. So then when Mm -hmm. I go into that, it's, that's got nothing to do with that, Ellie. He's just saying that he needs his alone time because he just needs solitude within himself, which is beautiful, which everybody needs. But because my wounding is still, that energy still exists, I interpret it different and then I change and I close. Mm -hmm. My job is to go, you triggered me, so let me go figure this out. And then I go into it. It's like, oh, this is what you always did, Ellie. Every time you reached out for love and like mom didn't give it to you or dad rejected it from you, right? You closed and you got quiet and then you just hid and you suppressed. So then my job in the healing is to learn how to open my heart, to understand where he's coming from, and then to understand why I react the way that I do. So the more that I heal that, now when he takes alone time, I can come from a place of love and go, oh, babe, go do what you got to do. Because I know it's got nothing to do with me. I know that he's just honoring himself. And the more that I love and honor that, I can understand him and show up completely different as a partner. Yes. Yes. I think it's so interesting how our brains are so quick at making like a different story than is like the the true story. Someone can say something and you take it a different way because of your wounding and it just becomes a whole thing. And it's, yeah, I, I, but, but it like, I I think it goes back to again, self-awareness and then coming back to love because you have to work on loving yourself. And then if you truly love the other person, you accept and respect everything that they request, right? Because it's all, it's all love. So yeah, relationships are our biggest teacher. (laughs) Truly. And you know, you know, the love that you're seeking from other people is the love that is you're seeking within yourself. We always have to remember that it always comes back to self. This is all about you. This whole journey is about you. And anybody that triggers you is just a window for you 
to see that part of you because we all have shadow aspects. Every single time we go through a trauma, every single time we go through a wounding, a part of our soul flies away. And our job is to bring that soul fragment back so that we can become whole again. That's evolution. Mm -hmm. Love it. So I let's talk about you know our the current society that we live in. You mentioned we're in the age of Aquarius. For people who don't know what that means, you can briefly explain that. And I, I guess how can we as individuals work to create more harmony <laughs> in society again? There's so much division, so much division, and so much separation. And it begins within you, literally. How can you show up as a light if all you carry is darkness within? Right. And so even when I, you know, during like, I remember I would go out for a lot of like the Black Lives Matter protests. Right. And you could feel the energy of hatred. Right. It's it's like one group hating the other group. Right. And hate doesn't hate plus hate equals more hate. Right. So then we all think like, oh, but if, if it's peaceful, all these things. Well, peace begins within you first. So our jobs are to see and to start to really heal all of the lower frequencies that keep us in a lower frequency. And if you look at the chart of vibrations, you will see that hate, greed, unworthiness, um, not being enough, all of these things are just low frequencies. So if we carry those frequencies within us, how do we begin to heal that so that we can raise our vibrations? That's all it is. That's why the healing journey is so crucial. That's why we have to understand what is our ego? How does our ego come out? Because our ego is always trying to say, it's always trying to say, to stay safe, right? So that's what it keeps us small because it won't allow us to look into the fear. It won't al allow us to take leaps of faith, to take risks, to go for it, to walk into the dark cave. But the more that you do that, the more light will shine out of you. You know, I went, I, you know, I went to this party a couple months ago and this guy came up to me. He's like, I don't know you. He's like, and I just want to let you know that when you walked into this room, he's like, I could feel your light. I could feel your aura. Aww. And it's because mm -hmm. all I do is work on myself because I'm so tired of, I hated people. Like I, I would go into like New York subway and I'd be like, I hate everybody. And like, nobody F with me because I will flip. That's, that's darkness within me. And so then the question is, how do I bring that darkness into the light? And how do I love that so that I can become love? So that when I walk into a room now, all I feel is love for other people because they are me. The more love and compassion you start to have for yourself, the more love and compassion you start to have for others because you realize they are you, you are them. That's it. So change begins within you. And people are like, yes. how do I do that? You begin the shadow work. You literally mm -hmm. start to understand your triggers, your programs, your wounds, your unhealed stuff. And you go into that. And you bring love and compassion to all of it. Because you said something before of like, it's not about blaming yourself or your partner. That's another thing that we do. It's like we blame ourselves. There's so much self-hatred for ourselves. Why am I like this? Why am I built like this? What's wrong with me? There's nothing wrong with you. People are like, I'm so broken. No, you're not. You're not broken. We just are in a world where we're going to experience pain. But there's a difference between pain and suffering. We suffer because we refuse to look at the darkness and the pain within us. Our job is to go, let me look at this because I'm ready to evolve. And watch what happens when you bring love to yourself, when you bring love to your wounding, when you start to understand what is your mind and what is your heart. You know, people always, you know, people always say like, follow your intuition. Well, if there's a lot of programming and a lot of conditioning in between you and your heart, you're never going to access your heart until you unblock the hallway. I always say there's a long hallway and the, the light at the end of the hallway, but all we do is throw debris in the hallway and then we can't get to the light. Our job is yeah. to dissolve and love all the debris so that there's a clear mm -hmm. flow to you and your heart. So the more mm. that you can be aware of yourself and start to heal, the more you unblock and the easier it is to access your heart, to access love. And then you show up in the world completely different. And think about you do this every day. Watch what happens to you. Watch the evolution of you. My best friend, yeah. my best friend, she awoke after like six months after me, right? And I love her so much, but she used to be a very angry, hateful person. 
Her transformation in the last three years has been nothing short of mind blowing because she takes re- divine responsibility over herself because she's, she goes into her darkness every single day and comes back to love and goes, how do I love and honor myself? And the more she does that, I've never in, in our 13 years of friendship, I never saw this girl cry in the last three years of our healing journey together. All she does is cry. She cries for others. She, when she talks to me, she cries for me because she can feel my pain because we are one now, because the more she unblocks, the more she accesses love. The only thing real in this life is love. And so if we can constantly come back to that, that's how we change the world. Yeah. Love it so, so, so much. All right, Ellie. Okay. What is the last final advice you want to leave our audience with today? I just want to let everyone know if there's anything that I understand, it's not wanting to live. I think that's something that I really, um, really struggled with my whole life of not understanding this physical existence, not understanding what the purpose of my life is. And the more I started to uncover myself, the more I just, uh, uh, dis, you know, saw myself and discovered myself, the more I want to live, the more I want, I yearn for the freedom within, the love within. And I want to let everyone know that it's easier for us to avoid our pain. It's harder to go into the pain, but hard work pays off because the evolution of a human being is infinite in this life which means how far can you go, which means how far are you willing to go, which means how much are you willing to love yourself and all of the things that have made up who you think that you are? Because who you think that you are, let it go into the garbage because who you really are will blow you the fuck away. Love is the only thing that is real and all you are is love. So no one understand that if this resonates with you, it's because your soul is calling you to go within. And I encourage you to pick up the call because this journey of coming home is the hardest, most brutal journey I've ever been on, but it is the most expansive, most beautiful, most magical ride. And I will ride this ride till the end of my life because I know that I'm here to go big. And if there's anything that I want to do in this life, it's go big or go home. And baby, I want to go big and go home. I love it so much. You're so good. Wow. So powerful. So eloquent. On point. Okay. Lastly, Ellie, where can we find you online so we can get some more? Yes. uh, You can find me on TikTok and Instagram at L-E-Y-J Lee. I talk a lot about my journey. I talk about a lot of the mystical life coaching that I do uh, with people. And so you can find all of my links in my bios, uh, my TikTok and Instagram. Um, Yeah. Places. That's, That's where I'm at. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much. Everyone definitely check out Ellie, find her on TikTok, follow her. And I thank you so much just for your energy. It's so powerful. And everything that you said is just truth. Like I'm sure everyone's soul can resonate with everything you said today. So thank Mm -hmm. you. Thank you, Aileen. 